I, I've been wrestling on what to preach tonight, I'm going to be honest with you. <clears throat> I started out with a message that was going to be powerful. It was the children of Israel leaving Egypt, and it was the journey into promise. And uh, I, that's not my message tonight. <laughs> um, and so my, I just want to start by saying my goal is not to offend people tonight. That's not my heart, and that's not why I'm preaching this message tonight. Um, but I, I feel from the Lord I'm actually supposed to share on this topic. I've been, I've been fairly silent through most of the political season on politics. I've been, I haven't shared much. I haven't spoken much on this topic. And I'm so grateful for Chelsea and Hannah's um, messaging for us. Uh, the, the Thursday nights we did, I really, you know, I think they laid out a healthy way that, that, believers in opposite ends of the political spectrum, um, whatever that's called, <laughs> political spectrum, can, can actually walk together as brothers and sisters in the faith. And so I, I've been concerned about the church. I've been concerned about what I've been hearing out of some leaders in the church, but I haven't known what to say. And uh, as you know, Jennifer and I were in a lot of self-reflection, even in God speaking to us at a personal level, but even at a, a political church level, I, I really haven't had known what to say. I'm going to be honest with you. What I see and what I have seen in the church, I'm uncomfortable with. The broader church, not this church, the, the church in America, I'm going to use the word, I think many of us are off. I think we're we're, we're, we're worshiping other things besides the creator. And so I want to talk through that tonight. And so um, I don't want, my goal is not to offend. And I want to say that. So I'm preaching this with, I want to be pastoral in how I preach this. But I also want God, if God wants to confront you, I want him to confront you. I've been really r very introspective. God, come to me for the last five, six months. And so that's the heart that I want to preach, uh, share this word tonight. And so part, I want to start off with helping you get clear on who you are, your identity, and where do you belong. And so I'm going to start in John chapter 18. What kingdom do you belong to? Here's, how G, here's what Jesus said, John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Verse 37, Pilate said to him, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus sets it clear that he's a king and that he has a kingdom. But he also makes it very clear that his kingdom is not a part of the world's political systems. And so there's, he starts out stating I am not going to enter in to your political conversation. I am a king. I have a kingdom. But my kingdom is not of the political systems of this world. Let's look at John chapter 6. Going back a little bit in the book. I find this very interesting. Verse 15. Jesus knew who he was. Listen to this verse. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So revelation is coming. An understanding is coming that Jesus is a king in this, in this situation. And Jesus is perceiving their human zeal, they want to make me their king right now of this, of this nation. And perceiving that, he goes, I'm stepping back because my time is not now. And I have a very different approach to my kingdom and my rulership. And so he, he, 
he made it very clear that his, his title as king was not to be submitted to the political system of the day. He's got a very different approach to how he is going to rule and reign. And it is not of a human, a, a human birth political system. Look at verse now. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Philippians 3 verse 20. I love this verse. I cut my teeth on preaching Philippians chapter 3. And I love this verse. Verse 20. For our citizenship, pause, okay? For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a king. It's very, very, very clear he has a kingdom. And my citizenship is in that kingdom. So I belong in the, in the kingdom of heaven. This is where my allegiance is. This is where my love is. That kingdom has a set of values. That kingdom has a, a set, a constitution. How do we walk? How do we operate? How do we hold ourselves? What does it look like to be a member of that kingdom? I think the, one, of the, one, of the fam, one of the famous statements over the Sermon on the Mount is, it's the constitution of Jesus' kingdom. To read that is to read the constitution of the kingdom of God, where I end up looking like my king. I love the things that my king loves, and I hate the things that my king hates. And so I want you to get this clear in your hearts tonight. You are first a citizen of heaven. And then a distant second, you're an American. So I want to remind you again, I'm speaking as a Canadian who holds right now a green card in Brazil, also holds an American passport. I'm blessed to live in this country. I like America. I like to live here. I'm not speaking down on America tonight. But I want you to understand you belong in a much more powerful kingdom. And your, your allegiance is to be towards that king, not love of country. Okay? And so we've heard this term floating around. Perhaps you have Christian nationalism. You know, and so what, <clears throat> what I think is very sewn into the very fiber of this nation is that phrase, God and country. You know, you, you probably heard it at a very young age, God and country. And that slogan, that phrase is propagated in loud ways and very subtle ways. I believe it has crept into our hearts. That to love God means I love America. To love America means I love God. And to a nominal believer, that is how they will position themselves. And, and that, that phrase, I think, is actually very, very dangerous to those who are not paying attention. And so this term Christian nationalism has been just being floated around. And it's causing quite a stir and so I just want to give you what a, a couple definitions. A guy by the name of Jeremy Beller, here's what he wrote. I think we'll, we'll get it thrown up there. Christian nationalism is the intertwining of the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of men. In the American context, it is often displayed by describing America through language reserved for the kingdom of God. For instance... To speak of America as a city on a hill borrows from Jesus' image of, for God's kingdom. The marriage between patriotism and righteousness um, further blurs the line between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. Next quote. <clears throat> 
Next definition. This is by Lee Camp. It is a perversion of Christian exotology. Somebody help me. Eschatology. I am working on limited calories today, and I apologize. It perverts the gospel in at least two ways. One, by falsely giving to a nation state a messianic identity. The nation state and the interest of the nation state are seen as the primary mechanism for saving human history. Thomas and Jefferson called the United States the world's best hope. Abraham Lincoln said that the unity of the U.S. and its form of government is the last best hope of earth. Woodward Wilson said that he believed that he would live to see the day in which America would reach all its hopes and would say, at last, the world knows America as the savior of the world. Donald Trump said, we must keep America first in our hearts and we must always keep faith in America's destiny that one nation under God must be the hope and promise and in light and the light and the glory among all the nations of the world. All of these are classic examples of the messianic pretense which characterizes nationalism. Two, second point he's making, by embracing Satan's third temptation of Christ to take up the way of might and greatness as the way of saving the world, Lee Camp. And so the third temptation that he's referring to is the pride of life. And so these are, as I was re- been reading these, this is massively enlightening to me. It's opening my eyes and I'm seeing so much of the belief systems in America. And I, you know, I, I think, you know, if you'd allow me for a moment to speak as a Canadian, I think there's a messianic complex on this nation. And if you travel, Jennifer and I, you know, we, I've traveled over 50 countries. And it's interesting, many countries look to America and want to be America. But other countries, a lot of European countries, They look at America and go, the most arrogant people I've ever met. And you see, I think we were born in to this thinking. It permeates all of us. It permeates our educational system, our way of talking about history. And whether it was intentional or not, I believe that our leaders have taken biblical promises and tied them to this nation's promises. And I believe that is a great error. I believe that is is wrong. And we're not the only country that's done this, so I'm not poo-pooing us. This has been throughout human history. But at at, at the heart, I think of what I believe is being exposed is idolatry within the church. Here's a definition of idolatry. Extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. So extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something. And within America, I believe, America the beautiful, America the great, that is so, we are so inundated by that. And then the the blurring of the lines between church and state, I believe in the hearts of many has been on purpose. That there would be a blurring of the two lines to actually, in my opinion, get the vote out and for us to get behind our parties and vote. The way that I observe things, I believe the Republican Party was very, very intentional at targeting the Caucasian church. I believe they invited us to get in bed with them 
and we would get influence and they would get our vote. I, I, I mean, it's very clear to me that's what they've done. As well, I'm going to say the Democrat Party has very intentionally gone after the black churches in this nation and, and asked the same question. We have been targeted, the body of Christ. I, I, it's just so clear to me they've come after us. We're a huge voting block in this nation. And in that, I believe the lines have been so blurred. And I believe that there's been much confusion that has been brought. <clears throat> I've been doing a fair bit of just thinking on this. And so I went back and I looked at the Crusades. And this is why I, I'm, I'm very, very, very clear that What's happening today, it's happened different times throughout history. So the Crusades went from 1096 basically to 1291, that, that time in history. And there was eight major Crusades. And their stated goal was to go with European Christians or Europe with Christianity as the flag that they were going to launch their Crusades under. Their goal, stated goal, was to go recover the holy sites. But I believe that was a total guise to actually just seek power. And it was a very, very bloody and ruthless conflict. And it, and it, came be, it, it ended up being Christianity and Islam, that conflict. Because at that time in the Middle East, Islam had power in the Middle East. Listen to this. Did you know in a popular, I got this from an, uh, a history encyclopedia, did you know in a popular movement known as the Children's Crusade 1212, um, a motley crew, including children, adolescents, women, the elderly, the poor, marched all the way from Rhineland, which is in Germany, Rhineland, Germany, to Italy behind a young man named Nicholas, who said he had received divine instruction to march towards the Holy Land. So they're even calling on divine encounters to go and brutally murder Muslims in the name of Christianity. And all, I all I'm able to see is covetousness and greed for power. Um, when standing at the gate of Jerusalem, when they conquered Jerusalem, after there had been a, a surrender, despite, I can't remember, I can't pronounce this guy's name, he was part of European, Europe leadership, tech, Tancreds or something, promise of protection, the crusaders slaughtered hundreds of men, women, and children in their victorious entrance into Jerusalem. So you have these men seeking power, covetousness and greed, motivating, but they called the church and under the guise of Christianity, the crusaders went in and slaughtered people under the guise of Christianity. And so you've got powerful men marrying the church and having this crusade be holy unto the Lord where all it was was brutal and evil. It's, the crusades were so wrong. And it's emphasized the, the perspective of Christianity. And I mean, it's given a, a certain picture of Christianity today in the, is the, in the Muslim world. Let's look at Germany. <clears throat> You know, Germany lost, if you're not familiar, Germany lost, basically lost the First World War. And in that loss, it was not only humiliating for the German people, but basically the rest of the world put reparations, what's that word? Okay, I got it. <laughs> On them. And basically they were just heavily, heavily strapped financially, having to pay other countries restoration. And it was very, very dark days for Germany. And so, you know, they, the, 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 German, the German people was a message that went through World War I. Germans' destiny, those were the messages. Germans' leadership, those were the messages that were coming and they lost. And so in, from 1920 up through the 20s and into the 30s, there was great pain and real challenge within Germany. And that's the seedbed that the voice of Hitler began to, to fall into. And that's where he began to speak destiny of Germany, the great German race and the Germanic purposes. That's what he said. So historically, 
The German evangelical church viewed itself as one of the pillars of German culture and, and society with a theological grounded to drift tradition of loyalty to the state. During the 1920s, a movement emerged within German evangelical church called Deutz uh, Christian, or German Christians. The German Christians embraced many of the nationalistic and racial aspects of Nazi ideology. Once the Nazis came to power, this group sought the creation of a national church called the Reich Church and supported a Nazified version of Christianity. And so as I've just been reading this, I'm just fascinated. Germany in great pain and great struggle. Much of Germany would have fallen in the category of Christian. There was a, a percentage, not, I mean, I, I, I'm not being accurate here, around 20 to 30 probably were Catholic. And then the majority of the rest were Protestant believers. And then within the Protestant church, there was three main denominations. And so they're in pain. They're wanting that former glory of their nation. And so they're in pain, they're wrestling. And then you have spiritual leaders who are laying in and speaking messages into that pain, the glory of Germany. And, you know, we sit here today and think, how in the world could a Christian believer end up joining the Reich Church? Like, how could that happen? But we have clear testimony where the, the nation's, the vision for the nation was more powerful than Jesus and his kingdom. And as that messaging went forth, good portion of the nation thought it was right that Germany should ex extinguish the Jewish race. How in the world? We have... During that season, again, the Berkenang Kerk, I can't pronounce the first word. I know the second word's Kerk, which is another word for church in German, i.e., the confessing church emerged in opposition to the German Christians. Its founding document, the Barman Confession of Faith, declared that the church's allegiance was to God and Scripture, not a worldly furor. So within that, the confessing church, Martin Niemöller and um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer were voices in that, and they came out and said, our allegiance is to God and the scriptures, not to the Fuhrer, not to a political man. And so we had a, a great schism within the church from a nation in pain, grasping, laying a hold of the Germanic race. Here's what came forth, interesting, from the Nazi party um, in the 20s. And what, I think it was some article 24, I don't even know what that is, but it's something they put, I think, into the Nazi platform. We demand the freedom of all religious confessions in the state. Pause. Insofar as they do not jeopardize the state's existence or conflict with the manners and moral sentiments of the Germanic race. So you get in bed with the political powers and they'll let you speak until you start to challenge what's in their hearts. So Germans said, we, I mean, the, the Nazis said, hey man, we give freedom to all Christian faith. Do what you wanna do, but don't touch our messaging platform. And so, using the, um, the terminology that, that's kind of been talked about right now, the mountains of influence, you know, you've got sports, education, business, and then you have the political mountain, and then you have the church mountain. So, these, you know, uh, Lance Walnow and others have kind of just used that messaging to help us understand spheres of culture and society, and then to really help us understand who we are that we are called to be a place of influence in a nation, 
amongst the people in a culture, in a society. <clears throat> but what I'm concerned about in this hour is that those two mountains today, their, their lines are really blurred. That we have this, this coming together almost of church and state. And there's, there, the lines are getting really blurred about the advancement of God's kingdom equals the advancement of the American agenda. And I'm, I'm really nervous. I feel like what happened on January 6th where we had that rally and then we had that riot, I believe it was the culmination or the fruit of what has been spoken in the last year. And, and it culminated in that day and we got exposed. The church got exposed. I just heard, I just saw a video clip this afternoon of morons, stupid people, standing in the Senate, like up on the platform of the Senate, the crazy idiot with, he's an idiot, with the horns and the outfit. He's praying to God, my Father. Another guy stands up and says, we invoke the name of Jesus here. What in the world? That seems like, I'm not calling, I'm not even saying we're at, at the stage of Germany, but they're using the, my Lord's name to advance America's purposes. And so unbelievers are looking at that completely confused. And then the church is, is there. Many of the churches are there. And I'm, I'm, I'm going, we have a huge problem. This is not, in my opinion, this is not something, let's just get it on the carpet and move on. God, who searches the hearts of men, is looking into our hearts, asking, do I love country or God? You know, it's interesting when Jennifer and I have come back to the States, and I, I saw it in Brazil, but I also I see it here as well where the church is becoming more and more irrelevant. And I think it's something as a leader that I need to admit. I, I'm aware we're becoming more and more irrelevant. I feel like we lack, we have very little power to really influence much. I believe we've given the authority that we have on that mountain of the church and we've almost given it away. And when we put our hope and our vote, there is no chance I believe God will breathe on me to the point that his kingdom will come in my life. I, I struggle to think that because I got my hope in a man and a system and I'm not humbled by the great God for him to come to me. And so I think we have to admit culture is massively shifting. The family is being aggressively attacked. I believe that we need to wake up to 61 million babies be, being killed in the womb. This is a problem. I believe that we need to be aware of the racial pain that seems to continue to go on and on and on. And then we look and we see sexual perversion at a whole nother level in America. I mean, when we came back on our visits and we'd start finding out about, about these apps, Tinder, and these hookup apps, technology is propagating evil. Perversion at a whole nother level, brokenness, sexual brokenness. And now we have the very core identity of humanity being shaken with the message of transgender, homosexuality. And we, the church pastors, we're seeing this. We're aware of what's happening and we're seeing 
the shaking that's coming, the, the turmoil that's coming. And I believe that fear is setting in. We're losing our identity. We're losing our moral compass in America. And these are all, these are all true. I feel it. I see it with what my son has to navigate as opposed to what I navigated when I was his age, it's night and day difference. If I had wanted to go pro- find pornography, I had to go get a magazine. And it was hard. <laughs> Today, www.whatever, and you're there. So we, I think, are, we're in a crisis. But what bothers me, and I'm going to be very bold here, what bothers me is my brothers, my brothers in the church. I don't feel the grace to confront leaders today. It's not my heart, but I want to identify this. My brothers who are pastors and voices in America are preaching a very, very confusing message. We have leaders saying, I love God, vote Republican. I don't care how they're saying it, that's what they're saying. And I have no problem if you are a leader in the body of Christ and you want to move over here, but resign as a leader here. Lay down your platform, walk away from the ministry, and become a politician. Because you're bringing great confusion to the body of Christ by speaking a a blurred message. Christian liberties, Christian freedom, I worship God. I believe if you're going to have that message, go to the political mountain. You're confusing the body right now. I got a terrifying chapter I want to highlight. So Jeremiah, thank goodness I was not him. He, Jeremiah chapter 23. Um, I would encourage you to go read this chapter. The whole chapter, I'm just going to read some verses from it, but um, it's heavy. And it's basically God confronting the prophetic voices in that hour of Israel. And he says to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says, verse 6, Jeremiah 23, verse 6. And I'm I'm using the NIV just for this one verse. I like it because I think it's more clear. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. And I'm going to say something maybe bold. I believe that there's prophetic voices during the fall that were speaking out of their own mind. They were speaking out of their own vision for America. And they're my brothers. I'm not criticizing them with a desire to hurt them. But I want to say, I think we had some prophets that were prophesying out of their own vision for America. I'm very blessed to see Many of them who prophesied Trump into office are now repenting. I'm blessed by that. And I'm, but I also think it's appropriate. If you're going to use a huge platform and prophesy and you get it wrong, you need to repent. And I don't know Jeremy Johnson, Jeremiah Johnson or wherever he goes by. Um, I d- I've never met him. I don't know who he is. But I believe that he was quite heavily prophesying Trump would win during the fall. And then he, um, he repented, I believe it was on January 7th. And then I'm going to read to you, it's quite a long um, statement that he released on the 10th. And here's what he says. After repenting and saying, I'm submitting myself under my leadership, So he said, I was wrong. And so now this is a follow-up. Over the last 72 hours, I've received multiple death threats and thousands upon thousands of emails from Christians saying the nastiest and most vulgar things I've ever heard towards my family and ministry. 
I've been labeled a coward, sellout, a traitor to the Holy Spirit, cussed out at least 500 times. We've lost partners every hour and counting. After publicly repenting on January 7th, I fully expected to be called a false prophet, etc., in some circles. But I could never dreamed in my wildest imagination that so much satanic attack and witchcraft would come from the charismatic slash prophetic people. I've been flabbergasted at the barrage of continued conspiracy theories being sent every minute our way and the pure hatred being unleashed. To my great heartache, I'm convinced parts of the prophetic slash charismatic movement are far sicker than I ever dreamed of. I truly never realized how absolutely triggered and ballistic thousands and thousands of saints get about Donald Trump. It's terrifying, it's full idolatry. If I helped prop up this ideology concerning him, I will need to repent again and stir up even more hell. On a personal level, I am just beyond relieved that the President Trump was not only a sign for a season and never a mandate. Revival is never dependent upon who sits in the White House, but rather who sits on the throne in heaven. I will continue to preach the cross and the power of the resurrection. I will continue to help prepare the bride of Christ to meet our bridegroom. As we head into 2021, expect me to be more committed to preach the gospel and making disciples than ever before. By God's grace, I will walk in a greater measure of humility, repentance than ever before. I will learn from my mistake, seek correction from godly leaders always. I love this part. I'm going to read the Sermon on the Mount now. Jeremiah Johnson. And I just as I... I got sent that, and as I was reading that, I'm like, we're sick in our body, the the church. For people within the charismatic world, that's our world, to so aggressively attack a man who's repenting. And for them to say, you're a sellout to the Holy Spirit. They are, their allegiance, their love is not of God, it is of country. They are more committed to the America the beautiful than they are to the purposes of the gospel. To have that reaction, it exposes where we're at. It, it highlights where we're at. And I'm great, I, I, I really honor him for stepping out like this and humbling himself. He's admitting, I'm, I need help, I need God to come and talk to me. And I believe that is an appropriate response. Look at verse, I wanna keep on going in Jeremiah, verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. So God says, the prophetic ministry right now is prophesying out of their own soul, their own desires, and I haven't sent them. And he said, if they would have stood in my counsel, I would have talked to them. I would have told them what I think. And then the ministry that I gave them, I would have anointed them with a message that would have turned the nation back to me. And so I don't think standing in the council is this ethereal reality. Here's what I believe standing in the council is. My Bible my love for God, and prayer and fasting. It's actually pretty simple, I think. Jesus wasn't joking when he said, get into the secret place and the Father is going to reward you openly. 
He wasn't joking when he said, fast and the Father will reward you. And my part of where I feel like we've gotten is we've ignored the simple things, the simple disciplines of a life of deep communion with God, a life of brokenness, humility, love of the word of God. And we've, as leaders, I'm talking to myself, we've not feasted on those simple things. And so when we get up and we begin to preach, we've not spent time with the Father. So we don't know what's on his heart. So what do we preach? What's on our hearts? And if you don't live a life of prayer as a leader, I really don't think you should be in a pulpit. I know that's a bold statement, but communion with the Father is the way that you find out what's on his heart. And I believe that 2020 was to shake the church. That our traditions are not the wineskin that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on. Our good building strategies, lots of lights, looking like a concert. I love production. But when your hope is in your production, your, your, your leadership skills, your welcoming system... God's, God's not going to give us his power. Are you kidding me? It's a joke. Like, like we're, I feel like in some ways we're so off. And when you read the Bible, you begin to be confronted going, maybe, maybe we're not going the right direction. Maybe we're not on track. I have pride, I have arrogance. I'm the center of the world according to Dwayne Roberts. And when I live there, think there, and then I get some ministerial success, ministry success, it's heady wine. I've been on some big platforms. And if you're not rooted, when you get off the platform and you go to the bathroom and you say, to God be the glory, and you cry, if you don't do that, you're going to end up preaching your own message. What's on your heart? Look at, what, look at verse 29, verse, Jeremiah 23. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces? Here's my desire. As a, as a, as, as a pastor, as a preacher, I want grace to be given that I can stand in his counsel. I can read the word. Revelation will come. And then that when I speak, it'll be like a fire. That when I speak, it'll be hammer breaking up fallow ground that the Holy Spirit and the word of God can come in and be planted in the human heart. I want to put my hope in the God of the Red Sea. I want to put my hope in the God of Mount Sinai, that when he came, the earth shook at his presence. I think we have so devalued, we have so brought down the knowledge of my father, and we have so exalted the arrogance of man, and I'm afraid. For America. I believe we need to repent of our idolatry and invite the spirit of revelation to open our eyes that we would see him high and lifted up. And that when I see society and culture breaking, I would not put my hope in my vote. I would put my hope in the saving grace of Jesus, the cross and his resurrection. That is the answer for a person who's confused in their identity. I, and it's, and the part that's troubling is I pray and I seek and then there's a great delay. When's God's power going to come? When's God's authority going to come? 
And in the delay of his coming, I grasp at other things to promote my vision. We, I'm going to call you now, pay attention, come out of politics. Get your hope out of that realm. Republicans, leave the Republican Party. Democrats, leave the Democratic Party. For a season, get clear. Man, I want godly anointed men and women in politics. But I want to call the church out, have an encounter with God, and put your hope in him for your future and the future of this nation. Our hope is not in the president. That's not where my hope is. Biden is not going to save America. But I'm telling you, Trump did not save America. What's interesting to me is Isaiah. He, this has always confused me actually. Why does Isaiah document his commissioning five chapters into the book where others actually document their commissioning in the first of, the, of their books? And so a friend of mine highlighted this to me, and then I did a little bit of reading it on this week. So Isaiah's beginning ministry was under King Uzziah. And King Uzziah started out real strong. But as he, as he grew in his leadership of Israel, he didn't take down the, the places of idolatry. And as success came on the nation, he made a fatal mistake and he began to become arrogant. And so this is where Isaiah is prophesying. And so as he's growing in his um, pride, he actually goes in as the king, goes in where only the priests are to go in because of his arrogance. And he goes in to the, into the temple. And the Lord actually confronts him, and he ends up with leprosy. And so some theologians would say that at the first part of Isaiah's ministry, he was prophesying a message and propping up Isaiah, uh, Uzziah the king. And so I want to read to you now tonight Isaiah chapter 6. And so I... I think it's very plausible to say that he was a, a prophetic man who was confused in his messaging. And this encounter, some theologians call it his second commissioning. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I just want to take a pause there. He got his eyes off of his political leader and he got his eyes on the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, is the Lord of hosts, whose glory, who, excuse me, the whole earth is full of his glory. I believe we need an Isaiah 6 commissioning and encounter to get our hope our fear to get it off of this season and that we would see the Lord. That the doorposts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. And here's what he says. So I said, woe is me for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, i.e., 
what I'm speaking. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. I believe that we are in great need of Ephesians 1 prayer, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And I'm going to say, in my personal opinion, one of the greatest lacks that we have in, this, in the body of Christ today is the fear of the Lord. We're not terrified at his greatness. Not in a way that brings insecurity, but terrified in a way that causes me to bow low with holy reverence, saying, he is God and I'm only dirt. That we have a revelation of God that so fascinates us. We're growing in our revelation of the Lord that is high and lifted up. And the spirit of revelation begins to teach you truths that will fascinate you for a year. And the love of God will permeate your hearts. Oh, you'll be in love with God. You'll be fascinated with him. And you'll walk with careful steps because he is holy And a call to purity dominates your life. And where that mixture of idolatry, pursuit of pleasure gets stopped and your love for God begins to dominate your life. Personal revival, an encounter with the holy. And when you encounter the holy, you are left stuck in your tracks going say, how shall I live before you? This is what happened to Isaiah. Where he got, he saw the whole, the very definition of purity. Holy, holy, holy. You know what that means? Totally different then. Transcends all of creation. He is totally different than anything you've seen in creation. He is far more beautiful, more powerful, more glorious. And when I read the Old Testament God, I want all of it in this generation. I want him to come and shake this nation so that we will let go of everything that is encountering, that is stopping me from loving him. I want it removed. I want a holy visitation of God where a generation goes, I am lost and I am deceived. Holy Spirit, open my eyes that I may see the cross, that I may see my need of sin. And in that hour, I am firmly converted. I don't want to just offer Jesus that can help you, but you don't change. It's just mixture, and you're not getting the fullness of the gospel. And so I know that this is kind of heavy what I'm saying tonight, but I believe it. And I've been wrestling for six months on on what to say. I've been wrestling with God. Where are we? I've been disrupted, and I haven't had anything to say. And I even say tonight, I feel like in some ways it's, it's not even fully formed. But I love this people. And I want you to have the spirit of revelation visit you, not with some good feelings, not with a a little buzz. No. I want the mysteries of God to be revealed to you. I want the curtain pulled back and you go, oh, Is this who I follow? One of my favorite sayings in Revelation chapter 1, the the God who was is the God who is, and the God who is to come. 
And just because we haven't had a Mount Sinai encounter in a while doesn't mean he's changed. He's the same powerful, beautiful God who's kind and tender. He's full of loving kindness. He's patient, yet he is God. And I want us to go deeper into the ocean of the knowledge of God. To be fully in awe of him. To be consumed by him. There's something that I've been just meditating on is Matthew chapter 9. Where Jesus talks about new wineskins and new wine. And every... Everybody has perceived that to be the wineskin is the, that which holds the Holy Spirit in a move of God. And I, I believe that 2020 was God shaking up the body. I believe that he was working at 10 different levels. But I believe he wanted to bring disruption on purpose. He wanted to confront us, and he wanted to challenge us. I believe that. And as I've been meditating, I I know that there's new wineskins coming. But it and it's not like, should we go from mega church to small groups? I don't believe it's the method. I, I used to think, let's go find the new method. That's not what I'm about. I think the new wineskin is led, first of all, by leaders that are broken and contrite. I really believe that this new wineskin in the next decade is going to be led by leaders who are walking out a lifestyle that is birthed in the Word of God. And they're going to have a limp, they're going to be broken, and they're going to be humble. And they're going to have maybe even been tested They're going to be chastened. They're going to be tried. So that when they stand with power, they're very, very aware of their humanity. And they're not going to be arrogant. This CEO-driven Christianity, God doesn't like it. This, This style of his church leadership is humble. The apostolic church was, the church was birthed in humble leaders who understood what it meant to be broken before God. And I believe it is on a church that is broken that a new wine is going to come. A new display, a new encounter of power and resting and conviction on the church where perhaps we are irrelevant today. We don't have voices messaging that really is doing a lot. I mean, we're having impact. I don't want to minimize. These are massively generalized statements I'm making. But I believe it's in the contents of brokenness. It's in, the com- it's in the context of humility that God is going to pour out his spirit. And if you're bored sometime, read church history. When the spirit comes, people weep because of their sin. People cry out and they say, I need a savior because the spirit is there. I am so grateful for the Toronto blessing. I am so grateful for Brownsville. I, I mean, the Lord in his compassion goes, body of Christ, I want to refresh you. I want to strengthen you. There was so much that was done but I don't want to live there. I want to reach forward for God's purposes in this hour with us being refreshed, with us being strengthened, having ways to find life. This is where I want to, this is where I want to go. I am leaning for a church. I'm reaching for a church that is broken and where the spirit of God is on them. If you've ever read Acts chapter four, It's beautiful. Acts chapter 4. 
these untrained disciples becoming apostles go in and speak to political leaders. And they go, these are uneducated people, but they have power on them. They get delivered and they go have a prayer meeting. And in that prayer meeting, you know what they say? Father, look on the threats of the enemy. And then, he, and then they pray that we would walk with boldness and with signs and wonders advance your kingdom. You know what heaven does? He shakes that prayer meeting and sends fire on the building. See, that's a wineskin. It's broken and humble <clears throat> leaders, uneducated leaders, walking in humility. They've just been thrown, coming out of persecution. They're huddled in a house. And God says, I will pour out my spirit on you. You will walk with signs and wonders as you preach my gospel. And I'm telling you, this is where I'm wanting to align my life. Where brokenness and humility would be before us. You know, it's, you know, it's, oh. <laughs> Jennifer and I have been praying every day. And as I was studying, I... I'm confessing sin right now, if you guys don't know. But as I was studying, I came to Psalm 51. And uh, I read, you know, I, I put this verse in my notes. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. These, O oh God, you do not despise. So I'm meditating on that, hoping to wrap up my message with that verse. And I close my computer. I go to my room to pray with Jennifer. And I, I said, uh, what chapter do you want to read today? <clears throat> and she goes, uh, well, I don't know. So she was throwing out some. And I said, well, chapter 51 of Psalm is amazing. But I don't know if we need to pray it. And then I said, ah, let's pray it. And I began to read it. And it's a powerful psalm, and so I'm going to read it for us tonight. And again, I got confronted with my sin. And it's a psalm that David wrote after the prophet Nathan confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba. If we would have the worship team come up, I apologize. I've gone really long today. I usually have three pages of notes, and I have... Um, 6.5 pages, so I apologize. <clears throat> I'm just going to read this psalm, and then we're just going to just respond for a moment. It's, I'm going to read the whole psalm. So just posture yourself before the Lord. But I was, even today, as I was reading this, thinking I didn't need it, God cut me to the heart. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and my sin and in sin in my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. I love that verse. He goes, you want me to be real and true. And as I am real and true, you're going to come and teach me wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The blood of Jesus, when it's applied, I stand white as snow as if I had ever sinned. I love Jesus. Make me hear joy and gladness 
that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. God, come and touch our hearts and get our hope and faith totally set upon you, that steadfast spirit. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not hide your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of, of your salvation. Uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach your transgressors your way and your sinners will be converted. He goes, when I'm truly broken, I have something to say to those who are lost. Verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These things, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion and build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with my sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. So Father, I truly believe we're needing help at the body of Christ today. I believe that we are sick and there's mixture. And if people are not seeing or agreeing with me, Father, it's okay but I'm asking that you would draw near this church, this community, this spiritual family, and begin to highlight idolatry where it exists. I'm giving you permission to come to us. I'm not going on this soul searching journey. I'm asking you to come. Come to us and confront us. Come to us and challenge us. Come to us our community. Oh, we need you today. Where we have put our hope in other places, we need you today. Where we've listened to messaging, birthed in the heart of man, Father, we come and ask you to talk to us. Where the outside voices are more powerful than your voice, forgive us where we've listened to news and Facebook more than we've listened to you, forgive us. Father, draw near. Father, come close. We're asking for that clean heart. We're asking for that contrite spirit. Father, we want to step away. We want to step away from where we've given our love and our hope in other places and we want to come back and we want to be committed to you. Father, your purpose is through 2020 for the church. We want correction. We seek help in this hour. Father, draw near us. Father, correct us. Correct me, God. Father, you know I want your discipline that I would be healed. Come to our church, Lord. I'm asking for the spirit of revelation to come. I'm asking for a personal awakening. I'm asking for a revival of the knowledge of the holy to come. Spirit of God, open up understanding in this room. Father, come and show us the God who is high and lifted up. Oh, we want to see what Isaiah saw. Open up the scriptures. Those unchanging attributes that you possess. Oh, let doubt be removed about your nature. 
America is not lost because you are God. So come to us, we pray. If you have children, I just would ask if you could go pick them up and you can even bring them back in, but we're just gonna worship for a little bit. And I just want you to talk to the Lord. I just want you to lift your eyes upon the Lord that we would see him high and lifted up. Just lead us out and worship Justin.